Hello, I'm Dave Moitz and welcome to Successful Farming. On today's program, I'm at auction tracking the sale prices of combines on steel deals. This time, I'm looking at the popular Case IH 8240 combine. Successful Farming's crop technology editor, Gil Gullickson, has a game plan for controlling pigweed. I've got some great shop homemade tools, gift buys, and make do's on shop hacks. And after these brief messages, our product test team features tools that have been put to the test by farmers. So please stay tuned. For this product test team, we sent Cub Cadet's latest zero-turn mower. This is the Ultima mower to Gary Ballard of Marshalltown, Iowa. You have a bit of a history with Cub Cadet. You actually grew up mowing with them. You kind of like IH as your insignia shows. But then you went away from them and went to other mower makes. And so this shows up and you're thinking, well, we'll see what, what's going on here. What was your general impression of the machine? Uh, I was a little leery because, like you said, we went away from Cup of Cadets many years ago, actually. But anyway, I was really impressed with the design of it, with openness of the uh, design, but yet the functionality of the design. The offset front axle on it for trimming, the, the notch of the, uh, of the uh, left rear corner of the mower deck for trimming, and the openness of the frame to where you had the visibility of, re of your rear wheels and stuff, again, for trimming. We've got fences and poles and a lot of things and buildings and stuff that go around, we right. trim around and stuff. And so first impression, I, I thought, yeah, well, I like the way it's built, but let's see how it mows. Yeah. Can't believe the job this thing does. Really? Best, best mowing job of, of all the colors I've ever had. Uh, it's got a really nice high suction, high lift deck to it uh, that, uh, not only does a nice job cutting, but it lifts, it lifts and, and disperses all the clippings to where there's no wind rowing from this. And you, were, you found out the price range somewhere around? Around $4,000, $4,4100 for, for this more as far as what the internet price was, whatever. Yeah. And uh, for that price category more, uh, for what you're getting, the quality, it's got a Kawasaki engine in it. The hydro in this thing, they're running uh, fairly large uh, hydro pumps. Well, Gary, thanks for testing out the uh, Cub Cadet. I'm, sounds like it wasn't too much of a labor for you to do. Yeah, it sure was. It was uh, totally enjoyable for us to do, Dave. And th thank you for bringing it out to us. Well, I'll see you again on another product test team report. A couple of years ago, Milwaukee introduced a cordless chainsaw. It wasn't the first cordless chainsaw in the market, but it offered to have huge amounts of power and the claims that the company was making is that that would replace any motorized chainsaw. I decided to get a farmer to test it. So I sent it to Terry Wells of Maxwell, Iowa, and you were gonna do some work on fence lines where you had to get trees out of. Now, you were running 16 inch steel mower or yeah. uh, uh, chainsaws then yeah. at that time and you weren't sure when I sent this out what to think of it because here it comes a little battery <laughs> on the side yeah. but you put it to work I found out you were using it quite a bit yeah we use the heck out of it we use it all the time the, the other chainsaws well, I always took two because when one wouldn't start and get out the other one right and then uh, this in here starts every time yeah it just works great well this is the yeah. beauty Th this uses it's all run off an 18 volt and this is a 12 amp hour uh, battery so first off is it one of those things you're having, if you're using it during the day, do you have to charge it a lot or does that last quite a while? It lasted all day long, but we, it didn't, really. use, we didn't use it constantly. Right. We, uh, but we use it off and on all day as we was going. Right. And then I got another battery that I took with us too. Okay. So. Well, the key to all chainsaws I know is a good sharp blade. Yeah. Certainly that's the case, but it's the power. And this thing goes to full power instantly, doesn't it? Yeah. Yep. So if you were in cutting a pretty sizable limb or even a, a, a trunk on a tree, was it ever bogging down when you'd cut? Um, no, it, it stayed right with it. I mean, it would, it would bind up like any chainsaw if the branch right. bound it. Right. But uh, 
No, it was. But power wise, power wise, it was fine. It handled it all just like the other one. So Terry, if you had to buy a new chainsaw in the 16 inch size, such as this, uh, and you had the choice between a, a battery powered chainsaw like the Milwaukee we we're showing here and a, a motorized one, which would you prefer to buy? On this one here, yeah. yeah. Because it's everything that you need right. for a farm operation. Yeah, and I don't have to keep the gas and gas with me or anything. I just get it and go. Right. Just keep some oil for the bar or oil for the bar is all I need. Well, Terry, thanks a lot for testing the Milwaukee chainsaw. I'll see you again next time on another product test team. Another product test team tool that I wanted to have evaluated was a die grinder. And I sent it to James Fred of Rochester because you had been using uh, a pneumatic die grinder before. But I'd noticed die grinders are not that common in farm shops. They're more like, considered more like an industrial tool. So that's why I sent you the DeWalt DCG 426, which is their 20 volt cordless die grinder. And I noticed one thing that, <laughs> that you see right away is the size difference, of course, with that. But uh, did you find that more cumbersome necessarily to work because it was so much longer than your old one? A lot of times that's not always an issue, but if it if it is an issue, then of course you go with uh, that. But uh, just the fact of not having to have your uh, air hose uh, dragging around is, I mean, worth a lot. Now, if I'm on the bench, it's you know, air your air hose is not a problem. But uh, I mean, I had a job where I had to go up and uh, grind a spot in the cab of the tractor. Right. Had a weld I had to put in there. Well, I didn't want to run my air hose dragging on the paint, you know, and stuff. So I go in there, and it wasn't a tight spot. So I mean, I, I had no issues with uh, having that extra length. Of the, but I mean, it was work, work nice. You just go in there. You don't have to worry about your cord getting on your paint, your tractor going in the cab. And, and it's not like you've had a chance to run down the battery doing a lot of work, but then again, how often does that happen? But it doesn't pull it very hard. So yeah. it, I think it's going it to be last pretty, it's, it's going to last a long time. We've always had a die grinder and I couldn't imagine getting by without one. But now with one that I've always wanted to have one that you could go take out. take out and don't have to be confined to wherever you got air. Yeah. And uh, after having one, you wouldn't want to be without one. Yeah. Well, thanks for reviewing the DeWalt die grinder. I'll see you again on another product test team report. Join me at auction to see what late model Case IH 8240s are bringing. Such late model combines offer some of the best deals in used equipment today. And then our crops technology editor, Gil Gullickson, provides a game plan for putting down pigweeds. All that and more after these brief messages. Welcome to Steel Deals. One of the best deals in machinery the past six years has been late model combines. When commodity prices took a dive back in 2013 and 14, so did farmers' desires to own new harvesters. Back then, used harvesters sold at bargain prices. And by bargain, I mean two to three year old combines with low hours, less than 500 hours, they were selling for dealer asking prices that were 50% less compared to what used combines were bringing in the early days of the 2010s. Now those bargain prices have become a thing of the past. Used harvester inventories have thinned appreciably and this is driving up the values on low hour combines in prime condition. This 8240 was the most popular harvester in the Case IH line when they sold between 2014 to 2018. And what is particularly makes this 8240 highly desirable is it has less than 1,300 separator hours. Plus, it's equipped with rear wheel drive, Case IH Power Plus CBT drive, and a load of other features. So before it sells at today's online sale, I'm going to consult with Kyle McMahon of TractorZoom.com, get his opinion of combine price trends. Kyle, we're looking at that Case IH 8240. It's a 2015 model, a little less than 1,300 separator hours. Am I wrong or have values of those combines gone up this year? 
Yeah, you know, it's a, it's an interesting hour range. It's over a thousand SEP hours still. Right. So we're, we're still seeing a strong demand for that. If we had another 200 SEP hours, we could see that value dropping off. But what's interesting that we're seeing in the auction market right now is we've seen a lot of dealers dumping low houred machines, you know, between that 400 and 800 uh, SEP hour range. Right. And so this is just a little bit over. However, this 8240 seems to be still holding its value relatively well versus it having another 200 SEP hours on it. Then the other thing it has going for it is it's a 2015, as you mentioned. So there's actually less 2015s to 2018s in the market. The manufacturers just haven't been making as many as they did between that 2012 and 2014 just combine manufacturer error, they just glutted the market up. So it's a pretty unique machine in the market today. So the interesting thing that's happening, I'm seeing a lot of 18s and 19s. Uh, Case IHs and Deers hitting the market. And it kind of surprised me. I knew we were building more of those than we did in 2014, 15, and 16. So in some ways, the combine market's a little upside down because those com combines, those late model, low hour combines, are not necessarily bringing as strong a price as you would think. In our opinion, what we're seeing from the data is it's really showing we're seeing more low hour machines and combines than we've ever seen, especially over 2019. Uh, 2019, we did not see as many dealer auctions. This year in 2020, uh, our, our sense is dealers are trying to limit inventory on their yard, and so they're selling more at auction, which is where a lot of that lower hour machines come from, which is, is elevating prices and giving a more, uh, a better opportunity for farmers to buy those types of machines at auction today. The 8240 had a four wheel drive, and this is always a debate. How much more does that add to a combine? How much more does it add? Yeah, certainly. So we use our iron comps data to actually uh, understand what that is. And it's pretty evident and very clear that they're bringing, four wheel drive units are bringing about ten dollars to $12,000 more from a used combine and at that thousand hour mark. As it relates to brand new, that option from Case IH is twenty-five, dollars sometimes $30,000. So it's bringing about half of what it was new, but it's also a used machine. So what that tells us is that uh, four wheel drive option is depreciating at the same rate as the machine itself, which is, which is a good thing. So people know, you're the founder of Tractor Zoom, Iowa State grad, Iowa farm boy. You come up with this concept not that long ago and it's grown enormously in such a short time. Tell me about TractorZoom.com. It actually came about, I was um, in the farmland world before this, recognizing the market and I started, I, I wanted to start farming and saw, saw how kind of broken the marketplace was. So we ended up starting Tractor Zoom in 2000. 17 to help auction companies list and advertise auctions and and today just over uh, just almost three years to date when we launched tractor zoom we're now working with 450 auction companies from wow. across the united states thanks for that information kyle let's watch that case ih 8240 sell our fully loaded 8240 quickly reached 146,000. took off again now 148,000. A series of $1,000 bids put it at $154,000. Bam, $161,000. Seems our bidders are considering it's worth five years old, just short of 1,300 separator hours. And this harvester has all the bells and whistles. Looks like bidding has stopped. $161,000 buys this combine. Online bidding on our 8240 just timed out. The combine sale price confirms that low hour combine values have certainly firmed up. I checked back a year ago on similarly equipped combines with comparable hours. They were selling for between 15 to 22 percent less than what this combine sold. The huge inventory of late model and lower hour combines that sat on dealer lots has certainly been sold off. There are other factors that pushed up the price on this particular combine. It was certainly the way that it was equipped. Remember, it came with rear wheel drive. Now, you could speculate that rear wheel drive could add, meh, a couple thousand dollars to the price of a combine. But why not find out more precisely what rear wheel drive's influence is on price? And you don't have to be an economist to do that. Now here's what I found with similar 2015 8240s with two wheel drive, asking prices ranging from $152,000 up to $218,000. Their average price was $192,000.
combines with four-wheel drive at prices ranging from $185 up to $225 with an average of $202,000. Those are solid numbers that tell you that rear-wheel drive is worth $10,000 more on 8240s of this age and ours. You can say I'm a nerd for numbers, but I love analyzing their trends, which is what I do in every issue of Successful Farming Magazine but I get a great deal of help from our friends at TractorZoom.com. They have a price trend website called IronComs.com, which tracks auction prices and auction price trends. Their numbers guru, Andy, recently crunched the numbers on John Deere combines that were equipped with that company's ProDrive transmission. What he was looking for is examples of price differences. He found that a ProDrive combine fetched a 13% price premium. Now you can add that premium with this combine as it is equipped with Case IH's Power Plus CVT transmission. Now that's the beauty of price comparables and the peace of buying mind that they offer. Now, if you want more information about tracking farm auctions and price trends, you can go to tractorzoom.com. You can also read my used equipment analysis and articles on each issue of Successful Farming Magazine. Well, I'm off to another sale. See you next week in another Steel Deals Report. If water hemp were a crop, Midwestern farmers could make a bundle selling this pesky pigweed. Unfortunately, another pigweed, Palmer amaranth, has worked its way from the Mid-South into Midwestern fields. In this segment of Weed's Playbook, Megan Anderson, Iowa State University Extension Field Agronomist, provides ideas on how to prevent a pigweed like water hemp from entering fields in the first place. There are a number of things that we think of when we think of trying to prevent weeds from coming into fields. And the first of which is obviously making sure that we're practicing good sanitation uh, and that we're monitoring field edges because those are likely areas where uh, weeds are going to come in. Um, the trouble with some of these is that water hemp is endemic, right? It's everywhere in Iowa. So with water hemp, we're really focused on management, whereas Palmer amaranth is a species that we can focus more on that prevention tactic and making sure that if we do ever notice it, that we get rid of it as soon as possible so that we can actually prevent it from establishing and becoming a big problem like we see with water hemp. For Palmer amaranth, there are certain areas that we think of as being high likelihood of having problems with the Palmer amaranth. Uh, so in particular, uh, anywhere that is using manure, uh, where feed sources could have been sourced from an area that's, uh, that has more of a Palmer amaranth problem. So we think of dairies, certainly, you know, up in Northeast Iowa and Wisconsin, other areas where uh, dairies are common and we use a lot of that type of manure. Uh, we wanna be sure to pay, be paying attention to those fields. Uh, anywhere else where we might be sourcing that feed, uh, and then the other thing that I would definitely think of would be fields that are going to be near grain facilities, grain handling facilities, where that grain may be moving across state lines. Uh, those are going to be high traffic areas that are likely to have problems with Palmer amaranth. As you can see, preventing a pigweed like water hemp from entering your field in the first place is easier than managing a field filled with them. For more information, check out Successful Farming Magazine's Weeds Playbook for more information on this topic and others. After these brief messages, I have some great shop hacks for you, so please stay tuned. Have you ever improvised a repair, fashioned a homemade tool, or created a shop get by and make do? Then you'll appreciate today's shop hacks. Can't find a funnel to add oil to an engine? Then take an empty oil jug, you cut the bottom out of it. Its spout readily fits into engine oil openings on your engine. And you can throw the make-do funnel away when you're done. You can readily identify wrenches in a toolbox by organizing them by size and storing them on a carabiner. 
Now, it's easy to select the tool for use. You rotate the wrenches around the carabiner, removing the individual tool from the carabiner's clasp. For large tools, you can even buy six inch long carabiners at camping stores or online. Another advantage to carabiner storage is that they readily hang on pegboards when back in the shop. We would love to hear about your shop shortcuts, tips, and make do's. Send us your shop hack. If we use it on the show or in Successful Farming Magazine, we will pay you a $200 reward. Send us a detailed description and any images and video to the address listed below. Please join us next week for another outstanding show. I've been touring the countryside, visiting outstanding shops. In this episode, I'm gonna feature some of the great shop ideas created by farmers. And then I head to auction to see what the most popular hopper bottom grain trailers are bringing, the Wilsons. I better warn you that the Wilson trailers are fetching a pretty penny these days. Gil Gullickson is back with another weeds playbook. Next week, Gil talks about managing weeds with a cover crop. And the shock farmer is back with his unique perspective on agriculture. See you next week, right here on Successful Farming. Hi, I'm Dave Mowitz. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe right here if you haven't already, and click that little bell right here to be notified when we post a new video. And click here to see more great episodes from Successful Farming Television.